Welcome. This is Roger Royce with Silicon Valley Impact on Tell Radio. Welcome back to our weekly show where we talk to the movers and shakers in social entrepreneurship, charity, philanthropy, and basically good works while, while doing business. And today we have a special guest. It's Christos Kritikos. Uh, he is with a company, Emerging Humanity. Uh, which does all of those things. So first of all, welcome and thanks for being here, Christos. Thank you. Thank you for having me on your show, Roger. This is a, a big honor for me. Thank you. All right. Now, I know, Christos, you're coming to us from Greece today, but you actually are, you spend most of your time in the U.S., I understand. So, you know, Silicon Valley is one of the most international places in the world. People are here from all over the world. Uh, in fact, there's very few people you meet here that are actually born here. Uh, people come here from other places. And I came, from example, myself, I, I came here temporarily 30 years ago. Um, <laughs> and here I am. So uh, it's a big community. I think Silicon Valley is more like a state of mind than a geography these days, uh, especially after remote work, which we're going to talk about. So I definitely consider you part of the community. So Christos, could you tell us a little bit about Emerging Humanity and who you are and what you do? Definitely. Well, Emerging Humanity, uh, first of all, is started as a concept. Um, to me, Emerging Humanity me means the convergence of technology and humanity. Technology has been evolving very quickly and uh, not surprisingly, society uh, has, uh, you know, kind of a hard time catching up sometimes. There is some kind of... Uh, technological advancement, some progress that solves some things and brings some new um, features, let's say, in, into our life. And that uh, also causes some side effects. Uh, so it's uh, quite interesting to me. I'm always fascinated of, of, uh, with how technology and uh, society somehow converge, how technology and humanity converge. And this is how I came up with the terminology. But also I use that, uh, that uh, um, a phrase that that uh, title for uh, my company, which essentially works with technology, works with humanity, and leverages technology um, in order to bring something better to humanity. So we essentially help entrepreneurs, we help uh, founders build successful companies, hoping that this will uh, essentially lead to economic. Uh, activity to business activity and that will lead to development and growth and hopefully something better for for the world around us okay i see thanks very much for that so you know technology um it, it's interesting technology i believe because of where i am and what i do i really think technology can save the world i think there's a technology solution to a lot of things but of course technology creates its own challenges and problems doesn't it I mean, everybody has probably heard a story about how New York City, there was a time when they had horses, you know, that, that they used for transport, but the, the uh, manure got to be so high, it became a humongous health problem in New York City because uh, they just couldn't dispose of all the waste from the horses. So then the car came along and people said, look, automobiles have solved the technology problem or technology has solved this problem of horses, but then we had pollution. You know, and then of course now we got solutions that that help with, you know, reducing pollution. But uh, that technology has created a whole new set of problems. You know, i.e., climate change. So, Christos, I guess I'd like to get your take on how technology affects well-being, and how it's been good for just general humanity and well-being, and and how it's been bad, and how technology can maybe improve well-being. You care to comment? <laughs> Definitely. Um, for sure, and uh, this is uh, there. There's many statistics around that. Definitely, humanity has overall has evolved, has progressed the last, let's say, fifty years with technology. There is many more people out of poverty and many more people living in better conditions than any other time in the history of the world and humanity. At the same time, there is two challenges with technological solutions. One is that it's uh, um, very difficult to be able to think of all the 
possible scenarios ahead of time and how a solution can create new problems. So that's one. But the second thing is also uh, even more challenging to think of in of all the different ways in which humans can abuse technology and create new problems. So not only we have technology that solves a problem but creates something else, like for instance, what you just mentioned, right? In the case of the cars, they solve the problem of manure from the horses, but they create pollution, right? And this is an inevitable side effect, let's say, of the technology itself. Uh, but you also have you know, we have bad players, so to speak, that could abuse technology in ways that, you know, normal people may not think of. And usually the people who create the technology, they don't think of these ways. Even, you know, even when they do the worst case scenario analysis and all that stuff. So this is a second challenge there. And we see this a lot like with uh, uh, hackers, with uh, spammers, with uh, all these things that uh, have been become part of our everyday life. And basically, it's a side effect of abuse of technology by bad actors, if we want to, you know, call them that way. Well, I, I would definitely call them that way. Bad actors is really a good, yeah, definitely bad actors, but that is a good example. We were talking about technology and whether it's been good or whether it's been bad and the challenges that come when we get new technology solutions. And as we're recording this in the news this week, um, Facebook is big in the news. They recently had an outage that showed all of us just how much we all depend on Facebook, maybe a little too much. Um, but they've also gone, become under scrutiny by the US Congress um, for uh, allegations that their algorithms um, are designed really more for profit than people and are designed to get as many views as possible. And to get more views, sometimes you got to be divisive and post content that is, you know, I don't know if it's like shouting fire in a crowded theater, but it certainly is content that is provocative. And it's created a whole discussion here in the US around First Amendment and the rights of a company and whether this company can do what it wants and whether it should be regulated or not, and whether it even is doing anything wrong. We don't know. These are just allegations. But I think we have to acknowledge that social media is a huge impact. And you know, the other thing, Crystal, that's coming out of this that I didn't realize is just what a big impact other social media, Instagram and TikTok, I don't even know how to use TikTok, but just the impact it's having on school kids and, um, you know, contributing to, you know, their health and welfare and mental well-being. Um, I know you've got some, some thoughts on that, so maybe you could talk about that and what can or should we do to make social media more of a, an agent for good instead of some of the negative externalities that we've been hearing about? Wow, uh, social media is a very huge, uh, it's, a, it's a big subject. And um, there, there are a lot of different things that we can say and of course and approach in different ways. Um, and just I'm gonna I'm gonna touch on a few things and then maybe you can get a little bit deeper on a couple of them if you if if if, if it's inspiring. But uh, one thing about social media is that it definitely um, it it's definitely part of our everyday life in a way that sometimes we don't notice. It's completely intertwined in our everyday life, and to some extent we depend on it. Like you said, uh, a lot of these platforms have been built for engagement. And they can be built in, in ways that will, uh, you know, uh, keep people engaged, uh, generate those clicks and those likes. And so they don't necessarily take into consideration the overall well being of the audience, but it's more about their time. It's eyeballs, right? It's engagement. So this is definitely one problem. Um, and uh, we see some of the results of that. At the same time, social media, though, it has created, it has created a huge democratization of uh, content creation. Traditionally, pre-technology, let's call it that way, um, uh, a lot of things would go through uh, authoritative gatekeepers. And this is not just news that would go through a news uh, outlet, even let's say music is a very nice example. Back in the days, you could make a cassette tape and try to land a deal with a studio. And then 
that's it. Like a music label would pick you up and they would take care of, of you. Now, there is no such thing. Technology has disrupted the model. You go straight from the source to the consumer, but that transfers a lot of the uh, responsibility and the weight of those things onto the, the source. So uh, in the news example, I'm a, I can be a blogger, I can create a video and post it on TikTok or on YouTube, but now I have to go and get the audience. I have to be the marketing, I have to be the promotion, I have to be all these things. So this creates a, an unusual until recently, I would say burden on all of us, because I cannot just, you know, focus on my skills or my craft and be okay with it. I also have to worry about anything else. So we have two trends that happen at the same time. From on one side, we have these platforms that they promote engagement and they promote collecting those eyeballs. On the other hand, every single one of us has to worry about these eyeballs, has to worry about getting those. And I think that creates a lot of uh, stress uh, and unnecessary to some extent until recently stress to each one of us. And you know that has other kind of side effects, of course, in how we interact with technology, how we interact with each other. Now, suddenly I go on a vacation and instead of enjoying the view, I get to take the perfect photo. I go on a dinner instead of enjoying my meal, I have to worry about posting it. Suddenly everything is about this online validation and online engagement from each single one of us. And this is where you know that starts having, uh, how can I say it? It affects our, you know, traditional, so to speak, way of engaging with life and our activities themselves. Yeah, good, good points. Um, you know, and we'll see how it evolves, especially here in the U.S. and in Europe. Um, but you know, I think social media has been a good thing. It's enriched a lot of people's lives. It certainly allowed us to especially during COVID to stay in touch with folks and talk to, talk to folks. But like you say, kind of your example of the hacker, there's always going to be some bad actors out there, you know, that we need to keep an eye on. I guess I'd like to, to shift and talk a little more specifically about some of the things that are going on in the world now and how it affects well-being uh, and, and what we can do about it. And of course, the big one has been the impact of COVID on all of us. Now we're all going back to work, you know, Stores are opening, restaurants are opening, bars are opening, clubs. Uh, we're seeing people on the street. Traffic has gotten bad again in Silicon Valley, you know, which is usually a good sign, um, oddly enough. Um, but you know, it's never going to be the same, is it? We've all found out that we can work remotely. Uh, we found out that that's a thing that we can do. And for some of us, you know, we found out that, gee, did have really changed my life much at all to be locked inside my house. I don't know if that's a good thing or not, but I worry that maybe the isolation is a bad thing. Um, is it? Is that a real concern, Christos? Is there anything we can do about that? Is, is there a good technology solution to kind of the new paradigm of remote work? Um, no. Well, thank you for bringing this up because it's definitely something that we all experience and that includes myself. Definitely, uh, the forced uh, uh, telework made a permanent shift because for a lot of people, the concept of working remotely didn't exist. It never had, it had never crossed their mind. And uh, um, now it did. And once it did, people start thinking about it and uh, approaching the concept of work and going to the office differently. Now, there is... Uh, uh, a few different things that I think they're important when it comes to, to telework. The office, it wasn't just a place where people would work, right? It was a place where we could find, uh, um, make friends, connect with co-workers. Uh, there was a sense of being part of a team and also a sense of community. Once we are uh, confined in our homes, a lot of these elements are lost. Definitely Zoom helps, helps us have our business meetings, but the sense of community or being part of a team or having the water cooler conversation, these are lost. And although these are not necessarily directly related to productivity, which is what presumably people do at work, they're still 
very important elements of you know our work experience and for me the most important of those revolves around community people need community want community they crave community back in the days they would find in the office now that they work remotely they have to find it elsewhere and i think this is an important element and technology uh, cannot really solve this um, we can make better Zoom meetings. We can have better platforms that would accommodate birthday parties and uh, uh, DJ sets, like all these things that got Zoomified. But the sense of community still, I think, to some extent requires a, a, a physical uh, proximity that cannot happen through Zoom. Yeah, that, that's for sure. I'm, I'm with you. I mean, I, I think that, um, you know, just there's, there's nothing like um, you know, just being there in person, whether it's at work or, or whether it's in social community. And, you know, and, and I think we've become more efficient now because we can do more remotely, uh, but still we have to have that face time. I mean, that, that's kind of my view. Hey, let, before we let you go here, uh, Christos, I would like to talk a little bit about some of the other things that you do, especially with emerging humanity. I noticed that part of your, your mission is, um, personal leadership, mindfulness. And one of the things that I saw on your website that really caught my eye was daily routines and the importance of that. Can you talk a little bit about that? And what is your daily routine? Uh, well, definitely. Um, you know, there is a lot, and I'm gonna start kind of reverse here. Uh, there's a lot of uh, books out there and bibliography about the seven habits of successful people and uh, the miracle morning and all these things, right? And um, usually the way things are presented to us is that by having these habits and having these uh, uh, regiments, then you can be successful, etc. But in reality, uh, I, I don't think, I think most of us don't, uh, and end up to that conclusion uh, from, from that side of things. We end up on the other side of things. And the other side of things is that, especially when it comes to entrepreneurs, I work with a lot of startups. I help entrepreneurs you know, build successful companies. So as an entrepreneur, I have these goals for the company and myself. I get up in the morning. I have the list of things I want to do. And then I get out there and life punches me on the face, essentially. Maybe... You know, I, I get into a fight with my, my partner or the kid is sick or one of the customers, the big customer decides that they want to pause uh, the contract for a few months and all my revenue is gone. So there is all these surprises that life throws at us. And once this happens, after, after a while, we realize that I started my day wanting to go over there and I end up somewhere else because of all this um, you know, unforeseen circumstances. And then the question becomes, well, how can I make sure I stay on course? And to stay on course, if I want to stick with my example of the punch in the face, I got to do two things. Not fall when I get punched, or if, or if I fall, get up as soon as possible, where falling means that I get off track, right? And so how can I make sure that I don't get off track? How can I ensure that I'm strong enough to face some of the sponges, or if I, you know, fall, it's not face down, but maybe it's just on my knees and I can get up quickly. Well, this is where the idea of the routine comes in. And the idea is that with the proper um, uh, mindfulness, uh, uh, exercise, nutrition, like with the, with the proper holistic approach to my well being, I can be strong enough to face the surprises of life. So I can stay closer to my course and true to my mission, my goals, and get where I want to get. So uh, it's if I explain it this way, I think it's it sounds much more obvious. But usually the books say, get up in the morning, get up at five in the morning. You're like, why should I get up at five in the morning? Well, if you go out there a few times and get, get the punts and you get off track, you realize why. Um, yes. Yeah, so, so that's the importance of routine, I think, is what you're saying, is that it just helps us build that sort of resilience uh, and strength and ability to confront all these unknown things that are going to be thrown at us during the day. Exactly. Is mindfulness a big part of that practice for you? Definitely. 
uh, definitely a big part because it uh, allows me to stay centered and uh, being centered allows me to not overreact to circumstances, but uh, a little bit think before acting, so to speak, and uh, uh, being able to face also uh, uh, the emotional roller coaster that comes with, uh, with the adversities of life. Um, if, I, if I feel pessimistic, then obviously I will not be as enthusiastic and I will not be as, as able to deal with things. If I feel more optimistic, if I feel more excited, I can do better. So mindfulness, you know, for me at least, allows me to, to stay in control to some extent of, uh, of uh, uh, what is happening inside me. And that allows me to deal better with, uh, with uh, circumstances. And meditation is a big part of it. I meditate every morning. Um, I journal every morning. I exercise um, every day. So all these things, the goal of these things is to maintain that um, uh, holistic balance and strength to, like you said, have the resilience. Yeah, awesome, great. Okay, well, uh, I wanna thank you. This is Roger Royce with Silicon Valley Impact on Tel Radio. We've been talking to Christos Kritikos. I wanna thank you, Christos, for being here and sharing your insights with us. Before I let you get away, could you tell us if someone wants to hear more or, or hear more about what you do or emerging humanity, how do they get a hold of you? Well, first of all, Roger, thank you so much uh, for having me. Thank you to Silicon Valley Impact and uh, Tel Radio. Uh, EmergingHumanity.com is our website and uh, Startup uh, uh, Coach is my LinkedIn uh, uh, profile. I use LinkedIn a lot. I, I'm not on too much of the other social media, but I think emergingshumanity.com, the website, is the best way to uh, reach out. Anybody has any questions, any entrepreneur that would like to get to the next level, feel free to reach out. Okay, awesome. Emerging Humanity. You're not hiding. I know you got a website, so just Google that and I'll find you, right? <laughs> exactly. Christos Kritikos with Emerging Humanity. This is Roger Roy, Silicon Valley Impact Tell Radio. Thanks for joining us. Be with us next week. We'll see you next time.